Where should we start? Should we start with the fact that it was a bit of an encouraging win against the Twins, but then it felt like a loss, and now we got the Tim Anderson news, and now we're kind of worried about Yoan Moncada. What speaks to you first? Well, first of all, uh, after last season, which didn't turn out the way anybody wanted it to, except perhaps the opponents of the Sox, we felt coming into this year with a good camp, even with the World Baseball Classic, it seemed like everybody was healthy when the bell rang. As soon as we started, we were in Houston, played a pretty good trip against them, two and two, and uh, we felt that things were looking really good. And then it started to happen again, very much like deja vu, and Eloy goes down, Moncada falls a ball off his foot, a freak injury to Tim Anderson. I mean, this is this is a really tough one because the team is much better when Tim is at the top getting on base, and he started off so well this year that you thought perhaps another batting title in his future, certainly a guy who was going to score 100 runs, and now we've seen, I believe, for the seventh time in his career, he's gone on the injured list. This one, of course, not of his own making, uh, nothing you can do about that. He was trying to be in the right position on a rundown play, Rundown play, by the way, that was not particularly well executed, but the point is that uh, he got hit, uh, the knee is sprained, uh, so we'll just have to wait and see how fast he heals. But we're not as good a team when Tim is not playing. That That's a certainty. Yeah, that's problematic, like him not being out there, because if you just look at the record of the team when Tim is not available, it, it, it takes a hit when he's not there. So how do you expect we're going to see the White Sox lined up with no Tim for maybe up to a month? Well, I think the easiest thing to do would be to take a lifetime shortstop who's actually pretty good at the position, Elvis Andrus, and move him to shortstop and then fill in at second base with whoever it is you want to fill in with. I know Lenny and Sosa has come up, so he's a possibility, certainly. Uh, I don't know exactly what they're going to do. But I do know that um, it started off a little more disappointing than we wanted it to. Uh, I look at the record, and we're sitting there uh, with, uh, you know, a winnable division, certainly. Uh, but still, uh, the team is off to a decent start. It's not a great start. It's not a bad start. It's five and six. It's two games in back of Cleveland and a game and a half in back of Minnesota. This appeared to be a three-team race from the beginning. It's shaping up to be a three-team race. I don't think Kansas City Detroit have it to make a run at it this year, maybe with some additions down the road, but they're not ready yet to win. But there are three teams who are ready to win, and it looks like the Sox are just going to have to deal with adversity early and try to play over it because uh, there's really not any other option. The games are there. They're scheduled. They're going to be played, and they're going to be played from anywhere from two to four weeks without Tim Anderson. Stoney, how do you compare and contrast Michael Kopech's two starts? It was uh, certainly seemed like it was a pitch-tipping issue, even though he didn't get the offensive support he wanted to in that Pittsburgh game, but seemed to be more true to form. Well, hopefully uh, we'll see the second incarnation of Michael Kopech and not the first. The first gave up five home runs. Uh, and was he tipping pitches? Well, I saw a breakdown uh, where his glove was different on specifically a curveball, not necessarily a slider, but he doesn't throw all that many curveballs. I think it was a case of not a lot of life on the fastball that day. I mean, those fastballs were 93, maybe 94 uh, in that game against San Francisco, and they were 95 and 96 in his second time out. Um, and, I mean, he was he was just outstanding. You lost one to nothing, but you're looking at the work effort, and the work effort was pretty good. He was balanced. He was uh, he he found a way to handle his emotions, especially after that brawl that ensued, where he was kind of in the middle of it, but still went back and got a couple of key outs in that inning to keep it a one to nothing game. So uh, hopefully we'll see the latter from Michael Kopech. I mean, he's got all kinds of skills. I'd like to see him change speeds a bit more, but. Um, He'll he'll get to that. Right now, he's just getting the feel for the stuff that he has. And uh, I think we're going to see a pretty good year out of Michael. I, I don't anticipate a whole lot of recurrence from that first start. You said something on the broadcast, and you echoed it with uh, Mully and Haw, and I'd love to talk a little bit more about it. It's the idea of Oscar Colas and 
Pedro Grafol giving him an opportunity to prove himself against left-handed pitchers, which I thought was a really great point that instead of just assuming, hey, lefty on lefty, that's not a great matchup, why don't you let the, the young player prove what he's going to be? How often have you seen it go the other way where managers say, well, this is the book on this kid as he's coming up through the minor leagues. Th that's how we're going to play him at the major leagues without really getting an idea of what the player can and can't do. Well, first things first, I, I think that Pedro is going to be a wonderful manager. I think he's pretty good now. But what he has to do is what all – first-year managers of a given team are doing, and he has to mix that with being a first-year manager. So it's not only a first-year manager with the Sox, it's a first-year manager overall. But he has a really nice feel for the game. And we talked last night. Uh, there, was a, there was a dinner that was put on. A lot of the staff was there. And I had a chance to talk with Pedro about just exactly what you're talking about, Lawrence. Uh, I, I kind of congratulated him for doing things instinctually that sometimes managers don't do which is giving these guys an opportunity before they're pigeonholed or characterized as, well, he can't do this and he can't do that. You know, you can manage spring training forever. You can have a six-month spring training. But you never really know about an individual player until you see him under the pressure of games that count during a 162-game championship season. And that's what Pedro is in the process of doing. Understanding what these guys can't do but not labeling them as, well, he can't do that, so we're going to make some accommodations one way or the other. And that's why I love to see the Colas at bat. I love the fact that he came through with a base hit. I think he's doing that to a certain extent. He's doing that with Ronaldo Lopez. I mean, Ronaldo yesterday was brilliant. Uh, he was throwing 100 miles an hour. The slider was in a perfect spot. Uh, that kind of visibility, however, if a pitcher gets that kind of visibility, he's going to be in really good shape. But what I liked about uh, Ronaldo yesterday was that um, he was getting ahead of hitters and he was making really good pitches. I mean, he threw a 100-mile-an-hour fastball at the knees on the outside corner, and there's not many people in the world that are going to be able to hit that. Then he ended up with a perfect slider, and uh, yet we've seen Pedro put him in in the seventh inning in a key situation. Now, he brought him in to face a right-hander, and he wound up walking him, but then he had to face Jack Peterson. Again, this is the seventh inning. This is a guy you look to to be the closer. But Pedro realized the gravity of the moment in that game. He realized that that very well could have been a save in that particular game. And Ronaldo came on and he threw, he threw a couple of fastballs. One was fouled off at 3-1. and one. At 3-2 and two fastball, he threw by Jock Peterson, got out of the inning, giving him a whole lot of confidence. And I think you could see it. I think coming off the mound yesterday, you got a guy who came in in a one-run game on the road and, by the way, the Sox bullpen was magnificent. I mean, Dylan Cease, after five innings left, he covered 15 outs. That left another 12 outs to be covered by the bullpen. And the bullpen, in a one-run game, was spotless. I mean, they didn't give up anything, which is kudos to the bullpen. And, again, kudos to Ronaldo, who came in and finished it up. So uh, the experience he's getting right now, and he's getting that because of the handling of, uh, of his manager, but that experience is going to serve him well when inevitably Liam Hendricks comes back. And when he comes back and Garrett Crochet comes back, suddenly this is going to be a bullpen that will probably be the rival of just about anybody. I know it's been ragged in the early going, but the arms are better down there than we've seen, and I think they're starting to show it. The last two games, this bullpen is unscored upon. That's did, we, did the Cylons get stony? Dang it. I don't know if that's ever happened before. He was the last person that I figured this is like the Cylons would probably be scared to get go after Stoney. That doesn't seem right. But you know what? Maybe that's what happens when the Sox bullpen finally performs like we thought it could. All right. Because this was the game we wanted out of them. Is yes. he back? Yes. Stoney is back now. Stoney. Boy, that was something. I mean, I, that, that stuff that I gave toward the end when I was disconnected was <laughs> unbelievably good stuff. I'm talking about stuff that they'll remember, you know, 15, 20 years from now, and then it's now it's lost to the ether. Yeah, we, we, we were hoping to get a Marconi Award out of that stuff that you were saying, and, <laughs> and, and now we got no shot. No shot. We yeah. can't recapture that type of magic. No, I know. It's, it's very, very depressing. But, you know, we'll, 
we'll go after it, guys, because we're professionals. I do think you have a great point, though, Stoney. For years, we were like, oh, this is this is the bullpen that people are going to envy, and the strength of this team is the pen. But they really showed what I think a lot of people have been waiting to see for years yesterday. That was that was it. Four innings, I, I'd like to see three. But it was still something that should be appreciated. Well, also, when you realize that Hendricks, is coming back and crochet is coming back think of those two additions to the bullpen assuming they come back with the stuff that we know both of them have i mean liam has been one of the best relievers in all of baseball one of the best closers over the last four or five years you don't anticipate a great fall off now look he took a few rounds of chemo you don't know how his body is going to react but if toughness is a criteria liam's got that in abundance and crochet coming back is a big lift because you can never have too many left-handers in your bullpen. And when Garrett Crochet is right at 97, 98 to go with a really hard slider, I think you're going to see a, you're going to see this bullpen start to come together. And again, the experience they're getting now, because everybody has to slot up a couple of notches with the absence of those two guys. This experience is going to serve them very well when the two big guys do come back. Stoney, what's your experience been like to, in these first ten games where you're broadcasting with? the new rules in place. And so there's a little bit less time for, for you and Jason to do your thing. I haven't noticed anything bizarre. I feel like you guys are still having a good time, but is it different now because the game is moving a little bit faster? Well, I think you can view it as being completely different and you have to make adjustments, but realistically, Jason and I have been doing this for a while and I don't think that there's a, a great deal of difference. You, you can't, you can't dwell as much, perhaps, and trip down memory lane, but um, that's okay because people want to hear about what's going on in the field now, which is what Jason and I help bring to the broadcast on a daily basis. We really enjoy what we're doing. We really enjoy our partnership, and I think it comes through in each and every broadcast. So if it's 15 and 20 seconds or if it was 10 and 15 seconds, we would adjust. The players would have to adjust. And I hear so much about, you know, the players, the older players not being able to adjust and maybe it's hurting them and all of those other things. Well, you know, there's a ton of excuses in this difficult game. And we have a tendency as human beings, and I'm not singling out anybody, but as human beings, we have a tendency to try to blame somebody else at times. And realistically, there's nobody to blame but yourself. If you don't get it done, then you're not going to keep a job all that long here. And and these guys will adjust. I mean, you know, they were talking about perhaps Scherzer was having some problems. Well, then Scherzer threw brilliantly last night. He threw five scoreless innings, uh, striking out six with a walk. And he held on a pretty good San Diego team. So apparently he's adjusting, and he's one of your older pitchers. So everybody's going to adjust. The broadcasters have to adjust. But I haven't really noticed anything different in our broadcast. Again, we're still having fun. Jason is still eating a lot. And, you know, all things being equal, I think it's uh, it's been a whole lot of fun so far. We would like to, as I said, we would like to have gotten off to a better start. But right now at 5 and 6, um, it's just this team has to come together. And I think last couple of games they're showing a little bit uh, a little bit of the team they can be. Now, the errors yesterday were very difficult, but it's errors with a couple of guys that are not going to be at the positions they were playing yesterday. Andrew Vaughn is going to be the everyday first baseman, not Gavin Sheets, although I think Gavin can do a nice job down there, but he missed one yesterday. And Hans Alberto made a mistake. Uh, however, he had a three-run homer, so there's a redeemer factor in this game also.